Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our webinar. Um, before we get started, we just, uh, those of you that are new to this, any questions you guys have, um, you're welcome to type in the tech, in the question box. I should be able to answer most questions by the, by the time at the end of the presentation, but there will be a slot for questions. Number two is that uh, this webinar is being recorded, so you should be getting the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation as well as the recording, uh, hopefully by the latest by Friday. Um, and also, we obviously have a YouTube channel where we're building up a bit of an archive there. Okay, so um, let's get into it. Uh, today's webinar's title is, Are There Cheaper, Cheaper Methods of Gaining Equity Exposure Than Buying Shares? So the focus mainly today is on uh, exchange traded products or ETPs, um, which offer some unique advantages. And uh, whether you compare them to unit trust funds or individual shares, ETPs or exchange traded products um, can be a it can be cheaper to own and trade. So yes, that might is, is the um, is the main um, focus as such. But um, you can see there by my subtitle, um, make your call it investment portfolio more liquid, uh, user friendly, and profitable. So um, that is my objective also with today's presentation. So before getting on to Real nitty gritty is there. I can kick off with a quote like I do every week. This is a quote from Philip Fisher. Now, please understand, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I just want to get my point across. Um, let me just keep my cursor there. Okay, Philip Fisher, he's the author. He wrote a, a very famous book called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. The stock market is filled with individuals who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. So yes, while the while the title of the topic is um, are there cheaper methods, um, just understand that in, in this context, what Philip Fisher is referring to is investing without education and research will ultimately lead to regrettable investment decisions. That's number one. And number two, research is much more than just li listening to popular opinion. So yes, while costs are important, okay. Um, it's also important to obviously understand risk management, which is, you know, if, if you go back to Warren Buffett's uh, rule, rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. So risk management is important, and yeah, we're going to talk about diversification. But also, obviously, we're looking at uh, a portfolio that's profitable, that we have uh, good returns, but uh, ultimately a portfolio, an investment portfolio that meets your financial objectives, your outcomes, you know, so the specific products um, that are meet that, that, that criteria, and obviously the term, um, the longer you hold the period, the longer the, um, your term is, obviously the, the more risk you can take on. So just understand that is the, the context where I want to put this presentation in today. So what is the current position? And again, as I said, um, I don't want to stand on people's toes. I just want to get a point across how many uh, how many of you know people that have what I call the herd mentality or the mob mob, mob mentality? Um, that's a one question. The other question is how many people do you know suffer from what I call an emotional roller coaster? So yeah, you can see my <laughs> as a quick introduction. Um, you know, the herd mentality or the mob mentality is where we follow everybody else. Um, the emotional roller coaster. By the time we most people get into the market to the top of the cycle. Um, and obviously, it's a long time to buy. So that's where they, they'll buy, and obviously, when the market falls, they sell. So the whole, the whole thing is the process gets repeated, and this is where most private investors lose money. So this ultimately leads to a lot of confusion, and over the last few months, and I say this every week, um, there's a lot of volatility on the market, a lot of uncertainty, uh, which leads to market volatility, um, and obviously, uh, people are losing money, and there's a lot of doubt. Okay. So... In this context today, we're talking about uh, having this kind of scenario leading to a, call it an unhappy retirement, where you're worried and concerned about where the money going to come from, uh, because a lot of people are not saving enough for retirement, number one. And obviously, people are worried about maintaining their current lifestyle, and they have to downgrade from there. So, yes, so we're talking about, you know, when I say... Um, uh, yeah, how can I rephrase this? Now, on the one hand, you want to be an independent thinker, but I also believe in having an advisor. And uh, that leads into what I, we will talk about just now, about active and passive management. So the, let me just get rid of my cursor here again, my, my little spotlight. Um, so what's our ideal position? 
ultimately, you know, be in a situation where, yes, uh, being an independent thinker, you're confident and uh, you're uh, based on your knowledge and experience and your skills as, as, a, as an investor, you build up what I call a, a, a nest egg. You have sufficient retirement savings uh, on the one hand, but also that portfolio of yours, be it um, um, paper assets, physical property, whatever the case might be, um, it's growing. You have a balance, there's, there's asset allocation across all those different cl uh, uh, asset classes. Ultimately, we'd be in a situation, yes, where we have a happy retirement. And my definition of happy retirement is what I call sleep well at night, where you have this peace of mind. But also, we have a situation where your retirement funds are growing. Okay, so that is the ideal situation to be in. So, how do we get there? And um, what are we proposing today? So, the current market situation, as I mentioned, is now globally, we are operating in a low return environment. Okay, where real returns are becoming increasingly difficult to achieve. I don't know if you, how many of you know that the JC All Share, the, the, the overall index, is down since the 1st of January till, to, till yesterday. We are down negative 1.13%. That's the JC All Share. If we break it down a bit further, a top 40 index, we're down 0 0.14%. Our mid caps, so that's the next 60 companies in the top 100 companies, um, they're doing a bit better. They're up 23.7%. So that's looking at the top 100. One of the best performing sectors this year has been the gold mining sector. Um, you know, the gold shares are up 84%. But you look at things like the top 25 industrial shares, we are down 3.76%. Um, our financials basically uh, flat, 0.26%. But also, our resource 20 stocks, our top uh, resource to, uh, stocks up 23%. So our market, as I say, uh, we've been operating in a very low uh, return environment and it's becoming increasingly difficult to achieve real returns. So saying that is going forward, I believe that correct asset allocation and, and stock picking, call it stock picking or share selection, will become even more critical uh, for investors out there. So the profile of the investor um, going forward, I believe, um, in, in future may differ materially from wh what's happened in the past. Okay, so that's just a quick introduction um, into what I want to say now. So yeah, we we're going to talk about um, over the last, um, uh, okay, the last few months, I've been seeing it more and more in the press, the debate between active and passive investing. You know, a, 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 um, uh, the uh, call it passive investing. Yeah, we're going to talk about exchange traded products, um, call it index tracking, um, and then compare that to um, active investing, where we're talking about a portfolio manager or unit trust fund manager uh, managing the, your shares. We call it your shares for you or your portfolio. Even if you're doing it yourself, you know, you're building up a portfolio, we call it active management. That debate, do it yourself or get someone else to do it for you. That's what I'm talking about today. So over the last few months, we've seen that um, um, you know, the predominant investment strategy on the markets um, is active investing. And the main ob uh, objective of active investing is obviously to outperform the market. So the goal of active management is to beat a, call it a particular benchmark, be the top 40 index, or inflation, call it inflation plus 2 or 3 or 5 percent. Um, so the, the majority of unit trust uh, funds are actively managed. Um, what the fund manager would do is that they'll analyze uh, market trends in the economy and company specific factors. And obviously, um, they'll be searching um, specific information and gathering insights to help them make the, the investment decision. So they'll be using more fundamentals, you know, some, some of them might be using more fundamentals, um, some technical, some quantitative analysis, some macroeconomics, uh, maybe all of them. But active managers, they, they, their whole belief system is that uh, because the markets are, call it inefficient, anomalies and irregularities in the markets can be exploited. And I'll talk about, uh, um, call it the um, efficient market hypothesis just now. But um, they believe that uh, because there's ir irregularities in the market, uh, with the right skill and insight, uh, they can take advantage of that and obviously outperform the market. So, um, let's see, you know, when we're talking about um, 
the market being inefficient. Uh, in, in, in other words, information not being disseminated the same, well, information not being acted upon the same time. Um, that's where the, where anomalies will will uh, occur. So that's in a nutshell, uh, very briefly, um, call it um, active investment. Passive investment on the other side. You know, over the last few years, there's been more and more funds moving into uh, traded, uh, the uh, exchange, exchange traded products, um, and it's getting bigger and bigger and more popular. But um, passive uh, management, and passive management or indexing, what it, what it means is that the portfolio management uh, manager doesn't actually make decisions. All he does, he constructs a portfolio that mimics or uh, replicates the index. That, uh, for example, the Satrix 40 is based on the top 40 index. So you'll build up a portfolio around, around that. So passive managers would invest in broad sectors of the market. We can call them asset classes. Um, and then obviously they're willing, this is a, we, we, as a passive manager or passive investor, you're willing to accept the average returns of these asset classes will give you. So you're not trying to uh, uh, call it outperform the market. You're trading in line of the market. So what's nice about it, you never underperform the market. <laughs> okay. So passive investors believe um, in the efficient market hypothesis, what they call EMH. Now, I have mentioned this before in previous webinars, which states that market prices are always fair and quickly reflective uh, of the information out there. I believe here in South Africa, not so much here. In the States, yes, but not here in South Africa. So people that follow this kind of thinking believe that they are cons that Consistently outperforming the market for the professional or the institutional investor as well as the small investor is very difficult to achieve. So passive managers do not try and beat the market, as I said just now. Um, they only try to match its performance. Okay, so if you had to do a quick comparison, you can see a fund manager. We would conduct, conduct rigorous research and analysis. Um, you'll make informed investment decisions. And obviously, he does a lot of uh, work as, as a manager. On the passive side, um, we don't do significant homework there. Uh, we track the, the market. So you can see the, there's pros and cons with all of them. Uh, the big thing here with active management is the fees. Manager fees are higher due to increased levels of skill, knowledge, and involvement, where passive investing, index tracking, um, their fees are lower, and obviously because they have lower operating fees. Um, the risk, and this is where uh, a lot of people say, whoa, you know, the risk of the fund manager, the fund is exposed to manager risk. What happens if the fund manager leaves? Um, that's one problem. At PSG, for example, I know that they have a team approach. It's not a, just a fund manager that looks after it. It's the whole team. So there's a succession plan in place. Um, but also, obviously, and we'll talk about it again just now, about market risk. We talk about uh, systematic risk and, and systematic risk is the whole market can crash. So yeah, that can affect everything. Um, what's advan the advantage of active investing is there's a range of strategies you can choose from. So yes, you can focus on equity funds or bond funds or balance funds. I believe going one step further, you can focus on funds that are just value uh, orientated or growth in or orientated. Whereas on the passive side, there's no choice when it comes to investment strategy. Okay, so um, just understand that. So you know the the the, ch the challenge here with with passive investing is now, we're talking about portfolio construction or um, structure, number one, and number two, a risk reduction. So when you come, we're talking about portfolio construction, asset classes behave differently from one another. So that's the whole idea is that you want to have this balancing effect. Each asset class has its own unique risk and re return profile. So they react differently to various uh, events or economic uh, 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 cycles or economic uh, events in the market. So the idea is to combine and I like this idea of combining various asset classes, each of his unique attributes, obviously, to build a diversified portfolio. So exchange traded products, and I'll go into the next slide what that's all about, provide the small investor, the private investor like ourselves, a vehicle to achieve the asset class diversification. Okay. So in the past, we weren't exposed to the bonds and things like that. Now you can through a share like an ETP. And obviously, the whole idea is to reduce the overall portfolio risk. So talking about risk, um, many investors, and I've seen this also in a lot of portfolios, believe that holding a portfolio of more than 30 large cap stocks, they're actually achieving suffici sufficient diversification. And I remember a few few weeks ago, we spoke about, and this is, uh, I've got my portfolio. I have between 8 and 15 shares in my portfolio, spread between eight, between um, three and five different sectors. So 
yes, I'm diversified when it comes to company-specific risk, um, but I also understand that the portfolio itself is not uh, diversified against systemic risk, systematic risk, and that's a, the risk that the whole stock market can crash. So this all leads to what we call a high degree of volatility, which can be obviously unsettling. So this will drive irrational behavior. People panic uh, and they sell out of fear at the wrong time. Um, but also on the other side of the coin where they uh, buy and leverage out of greed. So just be aware of those kind of scenarios. Okay. So let's talk about ETPs. Uh, an ETP is the exchange traded product is an umbrella term for, on the one side, uh, the uh, exchange trade funds, and the other side of the coin, exchange trade notes. They are different, um, and we'll talk about them in slightly a bit more uh, detail now. So the whole idea, you know, as I say, you want to combine the two approaches, uh, the uh, active with the passive. Um, the idea here is to... I believe is what you lose on the swings, you make up on the roundabout. So it's this crocodile effect. What some shares will go up, some shares will go down. The idea is they outperform or have outperformed to get a better return, but also to eliminate the volatility. So let's get back into um, exchange trade uh, 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 funds. It tracks a basket or index of shares. Okay, they both do the same thing. Uh, the the ETNs, by the way, are more commodity orientated. Um, so we're talking about a lot of the a lot of new golds or the, uh, gold and platinum and silver and things like that. So they're more physically they don't physically hold them. Um, some of them might use for futures contracts and forward contracts, and this is where the difference comes in. Uh, we talk about collective investment scheme ETFs are classified as collective investment schemes. ETNs are not because I believe is the risk. The risk here is that you have to look at the creditworthiness of the issuer, be it EPSA Capital or Deutsche Bank, and <laughs> Deutsche Bank's been in the news lately. Okay, so just be aware of that kind of scenario. But uh, the whole idea here is that uh, exchange rate funds are regulated so by the FSB, so, you know, that gives you that, that, that peace of mind. Okay. There are, you call it eight different asset classes or eight different styles, you want to call it that. You get the beta funds, so these are the ones that, that track the market. 90% uh, of all um, trade on the JSC takes place in the top 40 stocks. So, uh, you know, for example, the Satix 40, the BIPs uh, 40, those are just an example. But they basically give you exposure to the overall equity uh, uh, performance. Then we have sector, uh, uh, call it sector funds. These are, uh, I spoke just now about the, the industrial top 25. So Satix NE25, they'd be the top 25 industrial companies. Satix Finney will be the top 15 uh, financial companies, which is the banks, the, industri the banks, the proper listed property, as well as insurers and things like that. Then this is becoming more and more popular as well. I call the style or theme um, ETFs. So um, yeah, you have um, uh, funds that are focused on an investment theme. For example, new funds have a thing called a Shariah Top 40. So they comply with the Islamic investment principles. They can't invest into any alcohol or, or uh, uh, tobacco or gambling, those kind of stocks. Um, new funds, they say, is becoming more and more popular also. That's where you focus on companies that are BE compliant. Uh, and then obviously the other one also becoming more and more popular are companies that are focused on environmental ratings. Okay. Um, last week I, we spoke about offshore investing and I mentioned the DBX trackers, very, very popular. We have exposure to US markets or the UK. Europe, Japan, or the whole world markets. And more recently, we talked with these, they've launched the Africa, Emerging Markets, and China ETN. So different ways of having exposure to different asset classes. Commodity funds, as I mentioned just now, gain your exposure to physical commodity markets like gold, silver, platinum, and more recently, obviously, agricultural futures, uh, agricultural ETPs. We talk about wheat and corn, um, and other, other, other commodities like oil and copper. Okay. And then you got um, what they call the fundamental RAFIs. Uh, RAFIs is a um, kind of fund that it's, that uh, it's, you should pay slightly more for it because you're under license from the research affiliates. They're based in, in California. But basically, instead of selecting um, stocks that are based on, on value, uh, these funds are based on accounting value and accounting fundamentals. Um, so, for example, the APSA Capital, the RAFI there, 
and the Satix Rafi. Those are funds that are worked on fundamentals. They look at earnings and cash flow and dividends and that kind of stuff. And then we've got the fixed interest uh, bonds and the income funds, which help you track, for example, uh, the JAC bond indices. You've got the new funds, Gavi and the IOB, it'll be, um, ETPs, as well as the RMB inflation um, ETFs. And on the income side, you've got the pref tracks, preferential shares, uh, and well as the prop tracks, which tracks uh, listed property shares. The point is that uh, you can build, and this is a slide I've stolen from last week's presentation. So uh, one of the strategies you'd use in a portfolio is that 50% of your shares, of 50% of your portfolio might be individual shares, and you allocate a fixed amount to each share, which is when you're building up a portfolio. In this scenario, 6.25% to eight different companies. Uh, ideally, um, companies that are, call it uh, um, quality, undervalued stocks, or might be growth stocks, but they offering high high dividend yields, so you're getting that income from that side. But 50% of your portfolio might be allocated, to, in this example, to three ETFs or ETPs. So you might allocate that 50% and break it down into three. 70%, you might say, okay, I'm going to put into have exposure to U.S. markets, so DBX, USA. I want to have exposure to Asia. So through the uh, BNP, Paribas, Guru, Asia, uh, that's one other exposure that way. And then, for example, you might want to have exposure to commodities and new gold, absolute new gold uh, might be another one there. Okay. But that's how you would build a portfolio. This is existing share portfolio, uh, and then you have ETFs and ETPs in there to give you that Call it uh, additional uh, diversification. So the theme today, yes, is uh, talking about a cheaper option. So this is just want to highlight for you. And I've seen this mistake so many times where people go buy one share and then they obviously realize the cost is very high. Yeah, PSG, our brokerage works on a sliding scale, 0.9% for this first 25,000 with a minimum of 28 rand per trade. Now with the ETP plan, you can go invest as little as 300 rand. Okay, so a lot of people go, instead of go buying to ETPs, they go buy a normal share, um, and obviously with a normal share, a share trading account, your cost is much higher. But to understand there's a lot of costs involved with um, with trading shares. So we talk about brokerage, we talk about settlement fees, we talk about the investor protection levy, the security transfer tax, and things like that. So you see the next slide is more of a practical example. If you had to go invest 300 Rand monthly, it's better to go to the ETP plan. Because um, that is a percentage, you know, it's very, very small. Your brokerage is only 0.1%, okay, 10, 10 basis points. Where the same scenario, that 98 Rand is a percentage of the 300 Rand, your cost, your share has to move up 32% to break even just on cost, okay. Uh, settlement fee is 11.58, investor protection, very, very small percentage, once, less than, than one cent. Do not pay security transfer tax. Um, on the investment plan, and that's a big saving. Okay, uh, there is a platform fee, uh, zero, uh, sorry, one uh, percent per annum. So this works out to three rand for the year, based on your three hundred rand. So zero point two, uh, say twenty five cents a month. Okay, but you can see the difference in costs. Okay, so those of you that want to start small, I like the ETP investment plan because obviously takes in consideration. Um, rank cost averings, averaging, so over a long period of time, your cost should come down. But uh, this is also for someone as a long-term view. Now compare that, now I go one step further, if I had to take a 20,000 rand lump sum, if I had to put it into a share account, into an ETP plan, or into a unit trust. By the way, with, with an ETP plan, you can start with a lump sum of 1,000 rand. Your brokerage in this scenario on 20,000 rand would be 180 rand, ETP plan 0.1%, so that's 20 Rand, and on the unit trust, and I'll go into more detail just now about the total investment charge, it's very small percentage, 24, 24 Rand 94. Um, on the exchange side, and this is where it does get expensive, we have this monthly admin fee. Uh, the JSC charges us a, a BDA fee, it's, it's 40 Rand per month, so analyzed, talking about 480 Rand. So yes, if you're looking at equity accounts, the costs are quite hectic because of that admin fee. Okay, as I said, it's out of, out of our control. On the ETP side, um, the admin fee is 1% per annum. 
on 20,000 rand, it costs you 200 rand. So you can see the cost is still much lower than investing in equities. Unit trust, on the other hand, is the cheapest. I've used the example here, just looking at PSG funds. The platform fee, if, you, if you're buying it with just PSG funds, is 0.2%. I've spoken about this before. Non-PSG funds is 0.5%. This is excluding that. So 40 rand for PSG funds and 100, 100 rand for non-PSG funds. That plus that. Uh, using PSG funds will be 64 rand. So that's, that's a, one way of getting exposure to equities otherwise, other than direct investment. So what I was talking about just now, that, that total investment charge, this is using PSG equity fund. You can see that's the most expensive one, 0.14%. That's including VAT. So take VAT off that, divide it by 12, and that's how I got this number here. Okay. So that's the PSG equity fund, PSG balance fund. Slots. You can see it's lower. Um, but um, yeah, gives you an idea of, of the call it costs. And obviously, there's the big thing now from the 1st of October EAC, um, which you bring in, make it disclose more of the costs to everybody. So, what are the benefits of using ETPs, exchange traded funds? So, um, to simplify it for you, <laughs> um, you know, you can say it, it, it's a less risky. You know, and then compared to buying a basket of, you know, buying a basket of shares in, as a, as an ETP is much risk, is less risky than buying a single share, bring all your eggs in one basket. Okay. Uh, so the advantage here obviously is diversification and spread of investment it reduces your risk exposure. Um, and obviously also that we are only involved in the top 100 shares uh, most of, most of the time, top 40, but they're the most liquid uh, shares on the market. You must also understand that these funds, the ETPs, get balanced regularly. So this helps you reflect the most, secu most successful securities. We just had our futures close out. Uh, the top 40 stocks, the stocks at number 40 will drop out, stocks will come in, and, and vice versa. Price determination, ETFs can be bought and sold in today. Okay, uh, We don't have to wait until the end of the day to see what, what price you paid. As you buy it right now, um, you can see what the price. Uh, large and liquid, um, and this is what I want to focus on here. Suitable for the do-it-yourself investor. And a lot of you guys on this website are do-it-yourself investors. You do not require a financial advisor. So, you know, I like ETPs, and I've got it myself, where you build up a portfolio. I use what I call a, a blended approach. Um, so, yes, in the past, as I say, we didn't have access to certain asset classes, but now it's much easier to express a view, macro, call it a macro view. Uh, or investment view, you can hedge yourself. So you anticipate a particular sector to go up and down, you can hedge yourself. You can uh, go, for example, um, you anticipate resource stocks to fall. Um, you know, you might uh, sell the resource stocks and have more exposure to financials. But through one share, you have access to a basket of shares, like, for example, the Satrix Finney. Okay. So that is the main thing I want to highlight for you guys, that you can build a, a blended portfolio. Okay, so it's a great idea, Sean, but you know, you guys, some of you guys might have some questions. How do I get involved? If you get an existing shared portfolio, okay, you can add, especially if you've got more additional capital, uh, you can add um, ETPs into your existing shared portfolio. I suggest at least 10,000 Rand per transaction, then your cost is much lower. Remember, ETPs within a shared trading account trades like the share, so the cost is exactly the same. Remember, on, in the ETP side, on the, in the, in the investment plan side, you can go with monthly debit orders. Okay, minimum of 300 Rand or minimum of 1,000 Rand. Remember, you're also not paying any securities transfer tax, 0.25%. That's a big saving on that side. But those are two ways to get involved with exchange traded products. Um, are they cost effective? The answer is yes. Obviously, you, know, if you only pay once to have exposure to basket of stocks. If you had bought this in a, in a share portfolio, it would be very expensive. Because why? You'd be paying brokerage and securities transfer tax for all the shares you build in your portfolio. Okay. So, yes, to answer that question, yes, are, they, are ET, ETPs Cost effective relative to, to purchasing shares? Yes. Okay. Do ETFs or ETPs pay dividends? Yes, the ETFs do pay dividends. Remember, that's mainly shares and things like that. Um, whereas ETNs do not pay a, a dividends. So ETNs, remember I said just now, mainly currencies and commodities. You don't get any dividends or interest from that. Okay. So how would they work? ETFs collect the dividends from the companies. Okay. 
and they'll be paying this to you on a quarterly basis. So four times a year, you get this investment into your account. Yeah, these accrued dividends will be reflected in what they call the net asset value figures, um, and it's available on the websites and things like that. Um, so, whoops, so let's see what kind of questions you guys got. So I've run out of time. Okay, cool. Let me see what questions you guys got here today. Okay, Neil, um, at the end of the presentation, Neil says I need more information uh, or information on ETPs and unit trust plans. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I'll send you, there's a link to at the end of the presentation to the information on our website. Neil, we'll take it from there. Um, Milan, I'm not 100% sure of your question. So why single shares at all? Single shares, uh, as in buying one single share. I'm just highlighting the problem. A lot of people go do that. They go buy one share, um, maybe because they want access to the to the glossy. If I'm a shareholder of one share, I can uh, get the people to send me the, I don't know. I don't know why people buy one share. But you can also, for example, um, you're starting out, you only get 10,000 Rand. People go buy one share and then build up a portfolio from that. So uh, those are the two scenarios I have seen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Stuart, I presume you may be referring to uh, quite a few of those questions I asked earlier on, uh, early on when I asked about herd mentality and uh, the emotional roller coaster. Stuart replies, yeah, clump of people, <laughs> lots of people. That's it. <laughs> okay, Stuart, yeah, good. Um, guys, look like those are the questions. Eh? So, Neil, um, to answer your question, let me just get us out of the way. Look like those are all the questions. Oh, here we go. Here's a question from Stuart. If I buy 50 shares, sell 49, and use the last shares as an index tracker, uh, yeah, you can. Have, there's uh, I know the core shares. The guys from Grindrod have a top 50 stocks anyway. So I'm not 100% sure of your question either. Also, uh, Stuart, um, but uh, drop me an email if, I, if you want more clarification on that. Okay, so um, Neil, to answer your question, um, in conclusion, sorry, before I get to that, in conclusion, what I want you to gain from this presentation, just understand that you know, ETPs generally have lower costs than any other investment products uh, because most ETPs are not actively managed. Um, that's one side. And the other side is that obviously you have direct access to a basket of shares through one share. And that's what I, I like a lot. Remember, I mean, they can also be bought and sold in today. And also, I believe that just for the for the do-it-yourself investor, uh, it gives you easy expression of a macro view. So you can build up a, a blended portfolio with, with stocks that are um, global, some commodity stocks, whatever the case might be, all in one place. So it just makes investing just simpler and um, call it uh, quicker. Okay. Um, this is a slide I wanted to highlight for you guys. Uh, where was it now? I must have missed it. By the way, when we talk about unit trust, uh, the exposure to unit trust, remember the other advantage of unit trust is that a lot of these uh, unit trusts can also be wrapped up be in a retirement fund or endowments or uh, the tax-free investment plan. So it depends on your financial objectives, you know, it's your outcomes, and we mentioned that just now. Um, so it's not only people always think about tax, so that's one of the benefits, but it's also remember it's designed for your goals, your outcomes, so it's your terms are also important and things like that. So the next action steps, and this is what I said, Neil, uh, you can click on the little link here to take you to, um, to more of those, uh, the investment plans. Okay. Um, if you, if you have more questions or if you want to ask me more questions, Neil, you can drop me an email. Okay, you can also contact our sales guys. There's the, uh, the details at the bottom here, Neil. Okay, to help you. The guys from my side, thank you very much. Next week we're talking about uh, income in your put, a dividend income in your portfolio. Uh, the week after that, old school versus new school. That should be quite interesting. Um, and then 19th of October, how secure is your financial future? And are you in need of asset allocation? That's be the end of October. Hopefully by next week I should have the topics up for November. Can't believe it's near the end of the year already. Okay. So guys, from my side, thank you very much for being on this webinar. There's my email address. There's our contact number. 
be also welcome to please drop a uh, drop a email to our uh, to our wealth desk, and they'll also be able to answer your questions. Okay, the guys from my side, thank you very much for being on this presentation again. Until next week, all the best. Bye for now.